Ladies and gentlemen, I present Howard R. Bowen, President of the University of Iowa. President Bowen. Will Mr. Walter Ruther and Dean Mason Ladd of the College of Law please come forward? <laughs> Mr. President. A dedicated labor leader, independent thinker, an exemplary American, Walter P. Ruther has influenced for three decades the course of economic, political, and social events in the United States. His keen perception of the interdependent elements of modern society and his enduring sense of social responsibility impel him to vigorous promotion of interests common to labor and community. His deep regard for the dignity of man is manifest in his constant efforts to abolish discrimination by color, race, sex, or creed within labor unions and without. No living American has done more to encourage the role of unions in educating labor to take active, effective part in the democratic process. In the continuing search for constructive answers to grave demands and issues which face us, all Americans are challenged by the philosophy, the lasting achievements, and the courage of Walter Ruther. Upon the recommendation of the faculty of the College of Law and the University Committee on Honorary Degrees, and by vote of the State Board of Regents, I take sincere satisfaction in presenting Walter P. Ruther to receive the honorary degree Doctor of Laws. Walter P. Ruther, servant of working men and women, defender of American ideals, and leader in the movement to extend democratic rights, it is my privilege on behalf of the faculty and the Board of Regents to confer upon you the honorary degree Doctor of Laws. Mr. Ruther was presented to President Bowen for the conferring of the degree by Dr. D.C. Spreestersbach, Dean of the Graduate College. <laughs> President Bowen is standing now at the lectern, and Dean Ladd and Dean Spreestersbach are <laughs> investing Mr. Ruther with the foot. They are now shaking hands with him as the audience applauds <laughs> and are returning to their seats. Before I introduce our speaker, I should like to present a member of the State Board of Regents who is with us this morning, Mr. Jonathan Richards of Red Oak. Mr. Richards. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, the commencement address will be given by Dr. Walter P. Ruther. Thank you, President Bowen, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I am deeply honored this morning and most grateful for the opportunity of sharing with you this most important occasion. It is always a great privilege and pleasure to be asked to deliver a commencement address at a great university. But I think these invitations are most tempting because they never stipulate the specific subject matter that one is to talk about. And the speaker, therefore, has a very broad latitude. I personally have been somewhat oversensitive about being asked to speak on limited subject matters because of an experience that I had some years ago 
at the Berkeley campus of the University of California. I was asked to give a, a concluding lecture on the economics of collective bargaining, and I found that a most uninspiring subject. And I was somewhat concerned about the number of students who would show up to hear such a lecture. And Dr. Clark Kerr, who met me at the airport, said that they were expecting a large turnout and that they had moved the lecture to the gymnasium. And to my surprise, there were 8,500 students who came, and they told me that this was the largest non-athletic ga uh, gathering in the history of the university. And so I was very pleased. But a year later, I received a very pleasant letter from the head of the university who said, Dear Mr. Ruther, in all good conscience, I must advise you that your record was equal. He said that Dr. Kinsey was here yesterday. <laughs> And his subject matter was the sex behavior pattern of the male species. And I immediately wired, sent a protest, protesting this as unfair competition. And I consulted the National Labor Relations Board because I was certain it was an unfair labor practice. <laughs> now this morning, I should like to share some of my thoughts with you because I believe that we all realize that we live at a time when the winds of revolutionary change are sweeping our world. This is, in truth, a time of testing for free men, a time of controversy, a time of conflict, a time of challenge, which breeds great fears and yet high hopes for the future. I believe that the future is not only dark with the threat of nuclear war, and man's capability of total self-destruction, but I believe that the future is bright with the promise of peace, because the same scientific and technical know-how that gives man the capability of producing the H-bomb and the weapons of overkill provides man with the tools of peace and economic abundance and opens up unprecedented opportunities for human progress and human fulfillment. And the great unanswered challenge and question before the human family is the question, to what purpose shall we commit man's creative genius in the field of science and technology? Shall we harness the productive and destructive capability of the 20th century technological revolution to man's ultimate inhumanity to man in nuclear war? Or can we build a rational and responsible world community in which we can harness the rising star of science and technology to man's peaceful purposes and extend the frontiers of human betterment and open up new opportunities for human fulfillment? This is the great challenge. The 20th century technological revolution has no ideology and it has no morality we must bend it to man's peaceful hopes and aspirations. I believe that our basic dilemma is the fact that we are making unprecedented progress in the physical sciences, in the art of working with machines and with materials. And we are failing to make comparable progress in the human and social science, in the art of working and living with man. And it's this moral and cultural lag between the technical know-how and the lack of human know-why that creates the source of our basic problem. And this gap, I believe, puts both the peace of the world and the survival of the human family in jeopardy because it places the guided missile into the hands of misguided men. All of the nations of the world, as we meet this morning, are prisoners of the arms race, and no nation can escape that prison unilaterally. It is estimated by competent authority that the United States and the Soviet Union have in combination a nuclear destructive capability equal to 40 tons of TNT for every man, every woman, every child in the world. And it would seem to me that faced with these frightening facts, that the choice before the human family is both clear and compelling. Either the human family 
must act rationally to end the nuclear arms race or by calculation or miscalculation in time the nuclear arms race will end the human race. I believe that we must free ourselves from the antiquated and narrow concepts of nationalism and together with free people everywhere strengthen the United Nations and make it into an effective instrument with which mankind can search for both sanity and survival. We all realize that the realities of a troubled world require that we be strong on the military front. But military power, we need to understand, is but the negative aspect of a dynamic foreign policy. Each of us, I believe, prays that peace will come to that tragic country in South Asia and that they will find the answers at the conference table because there will be no answers to be found on the military front. I share the view that we need to shift freedom's fight in Asia from the battlefields to the rice fields because that's where we need to win over hunger and poverty and social injustice. And because America is the strongest of the free nations of the world, because we are more richly blessed than any other nation in the world in terms of material resources and productive power, and because we do have a rich democratic heritage to give that power a sense of purpose and a sense of morality, we must take the lead and we must commit adequate resources to shift the dynamics of the world power struggle from the negative nuclear arms race that no one can win to a positive contest, a contest between our competing social systems to see which social system can best harness man's creative capability in the field of science and technology and relate that capacity to the unmet needs of the human family. I am confident that in such a positive contact, the contest that our system of freedom will be equal to the challenge. I believe that we must mobilize a grand alliance for the waging of the peace, and we must allocate adequate resources to make a total effort in the struggle against poverty and hunger and ignorance and disease in the emerging nations of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, where the balance of power between the forces of freedom and the forces of tyranny reside. We need, I believe, since we live in a country where we enjoy tremendous material wealth, understand that just as peace and freedom are indivisible, so is social justice, and that we can't make the values that we believe and that we cherish as a free people secure, accepting as we make them universal so that all mankind may share their blessings. When we look at the world, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people in Asia and Africa and Latin America are being swept forward in a great tidal wave of humanity, which Adlai Stevenson has called the revolution of rising expectation. These people are determined to catch up with the 20th century. Now, the communists did not start that revolution of rising expectations. They would like to ride on its naked back, and they would like to exploit human desperation and forge human poverty into political power. And when they offer economic security to desperate people, many times they are not aware of the fact that it comes with a tragic price tag of political and spiritual enslavement. And what we need to do is to demonstrate, not by pious platitudes or slick slogans or glowing generalities about the virtues of democracy. We must demonstrate by the propaganda of the democratic deed that the world that we are committed to build with free men everywhere is a world in which people can have both bread and freedom. The communists look at our country, and I believe that they build their long-range strategy, strategy upon a concept that our free society is composed of competing and conflicting, irreconcilable economic pressure groups, and that we as a free people 
are incapable of rising above that pressure group relationship and achieving a sense of national purpose in the absence of war. They know, as history records, that when we are driven by the negative forces of war, when we share common fears and common hatreds, we are equal to a total effort. And I believe that we must demonstrate that we have the capability and the sense of common commitment, motivated by common hopes and common aspirations and a common faith, that we are equal to a comparable total effort in achieving the rewarding purposes of peace. Now, our president has called upon the people of our great nation to join in the building of the great society, a society, he says, that should be more concerned about the quality of its goals than the quantity of its goods. I believe that we can achieve the great society, but I believe that we need to get our value system into sharper focus, and we need to work out a list of national priorities in which we put first things first, and then we need to commit ourselves and our resources in a measure equal to the dimensions of the problem so that we can bring to practical fulfillment these national priorities. Now, the agenda of our unfinished work in America is both long and it is urgent. We need, I believe, to act boldly at every level of our society to overcome both the quantitative and the qualitative deficits in education. We need also to make it possible to have education and human development be made into a kind of a continued process so that education doesn't end just when you get your diploma. We need also to commit greater resources to abolish human poverty in this land of plenty. There can be no moral defense of a nation that tolerates human poverty with a gross national product in 1966 that will exceed $730 billions. And we need to act with courage and compassion to complete the civil rights revolution. There will be no halfway house on the road to human freedom. But the trouble in America is there is sometimes a great deal of noble talk, as Bishop Oxton once said, about human brotherhood. And then too many Americans in some parts of America drop the brother and keep the hood. There are many other urgent matters on our agenda of unfinished business. We need to wipe out the slums and build healthy, wholesome communities worthy of free men. We need to end the pollution of our air and our water and to beautify our cities and our landscape and conserve our resources. Now, we have everything it takes to do this job. No other country is more richly blessed in the essential ingredients for the solution of the problems of the whole community so that everyone can share in the abundance that now is within our grasp. And what we need is the will and the sense of national purpose to get on with this task. Now, if we are to solve these many challenging problems, then I believe that we must search for new ideas and new concepts and new innovations and new social invention because we will not solve tomorrow's problems with yesterday's tools. And if we are to find these new answers and these new ideas and new concepts, then I believe they must be found in a revitalized free marketplace of ideas where we can test each new idea in the fierce fires of free debate in that free marketplace of ideas. Abraham Lincoln, in his profound wisdom, said many years ago, during another very crucial period in the history of our great nation, these words. He said, the dogmas of the past are not adequate for the stormy present. Our cause is new. We must think anew. We must act anew. John Kennedy put it a different way when he draw a, drew a sharp distinction between opinion and thought. And he said, we must reject the comfort of thought and accept the discomfort, I mean, we must reject the, the comfort of opinion and reject and accept the discomfort of thought. I believe that basically what we need is to achieve that level of objectivity 
so that America will be capable of judging each new idea based upon its substance and not upon its source. But one of the problems in a free society like ours, which is being fed a steady diet, a pre-digested, homogenized mass culture of carefully cultivated Madison Avenue cliches, is that we need eternally to be on guard against the sterile and stagnant and deadly forces of conformity. A totalitarian society gets its unity through absolute conformity, through compulsion. But the genius of a free society is its capability of achieving unity in the splendor of human diversity. This is what the little men on the lunatic fringe, the self-appointed super patriots in America, have not understood. They are filled with fear and frustration, and they are desperately committed to trying to repeal the 20th century. We must stay alive in the 20th century. We must meet its challenges so that we might realize its bright promise. Each of us, I believe, shares the responsibility in helping our free society find these new answers to meet these new challenges. Each of us must dare to think anew and be prepared to act together anew. And the test of our courage and the test of our conviction and the test of our individual personal commitment is not where do we stand in the hour of convenience and comfort. Anybody can believe in anything under those circumstances. The test is where do you stand in the hour of challenge, in the hour of controversy, when the whirlwinds are blowing around you and you feel alone? Do you believe deeply enough to act true to the whispering of your inner faith? That is the great challenge. I have unlimited faith in the capability of free men and our free institutions. I am confident that free men are equal to history's call to greatness, and that together with good men of goodwill everywhere, we can build a rational and responsible world community. We can harness the rising star of science and technology to man's peaceful purposes. We can translate the 20th century technological revolution into the 20th century revolution of human fulfillment. To each member of the graduating class, I extend my heartiest congratulations on your academic achievements. And I wish each of you well, good luck, and Godspeed in the years ahead. Thank you. You have been listening to the principal address at the June commencement exercises of the University of Iowa. The speaker was Walter P. Ruther, President of the United Automobile Workers of America and Vice President of the AFL-CIO. Now Professor William Coder for the announcement of awards, honors, and prizes. The names of students who have received awards, honors, and prizes are listed beginning on page seven and at the end of the college sections of your commencement program. Well, the students who have been chosen to represent this large group of scholars, please rise as I read their names and come forward to the platform. Betty Jeanette Smith, Colleges of Liberal Arts and Education. Carol Jean Ross, Honors Program, College of Liberal Arts. Michael Murray Martin, College of Law. Alan Kent Ryder, College of Medicine. David William Schrode, College of Dentistry. Cherry Lee Sweeting, College of Pharmacy. <coughs> Ron
Raymond Frank Mahachek, College of Engineering. Karen Rose DeBolt, College of Nursing. Jerry Fred Ward, College of Business Administration. These nine students, whose names have just been read by Mr. Coder, Master of Ceremonies, represent the literally dozens of students who have received honors and awards during the course of the year. Uh, the, in the printed program, there are more than eight pages devoted to the listing of these prizes and honors and the names of the students who received them. While their names were being called, um, the students whose names were called first were, have, were marching to the platform. Uh, they have nearly all now made their way up to the platform and are walking over toward Mr. Coder. And Mr. Coder will present them to President Bowen as representative of all the students who have won honors during the course of the year. President, I present these nine distinguished scholars who, because of their own superior attainments, have been chosen to represent the great group of university scholars whom today we honor because of marked superiority. Ms. Ross, Mr. Martin, Mr. Ryder, Mr. Schrode, Ms. Sweeting, Mr. Mahachek, Ms. DeBolt, and Mr. Ward, for your own high distinction, the University of Iowa congratulates you and through you, the great company of university scholars, you have the honor to represent. Now the nine representatives of all the students winning honors and awards are walking across the platform uh, to President Bowen. Uh, <coughs> President Bowen's chair is on the south side of the platform. President Bowen is handing each of these nine people a letter uh, of congratulations and shaking hands with each person. He just shook hands with the ninth of the student representatives, and the students now are moving uh, down onto the main floor and are making their way back to their uh, seats. The next um, uh, order of business in the commencement exercises is the conferring of advanced degrees in the arts and sciences. The PhD candidates first. Mr. Coder will call the name of each PhD candidate. And these candidates, as we said earlier, will walk up on the platform and will receive their diplomas well, those men personally who were from this the president. By the Air or Army ROTC, please rise. The men who are standing and whose names appear on page 55 of your program were earlier commissioned today. Please. These are the 74 people that I mentioned earlier in the program who received degrees at the ceremonies at 8 this morning. Now we come to the uh, conferring of the advanced degrees. Dean Spriestersbach is, is approaching the podium to uh, introduce um, the PhD uh, candidates as a group, and then At their names time, will be called by Mr. Coates. I would like to salute and congratulate all of the candidates whose degrees are conferred upon the recommendation of the faculty of the Graduate College. Today, these degrees include the Master of Arts, Master of Science, Master of Business Administration, Master of Fine Arts, Master of Social Work, Master of Arts and Teaching, Specialist in Education, and Doctor of Philosophy. The degree that each of you is about to receive is a symbol that identifies you as a person who has sensed the power and richness of your own intellect. It identifies you as a person who has achieved a high level of special skill and understanding. It also identifies you as a person who is able to accept a correspondingly high level of responsibility. It does not, however, 
identify you as one who is able to coast, insured of recognition. To be sure, you can enjoy considerable success by employing the special skills that you have in the performance of routine tasks. You can perpetuate ineffective and inefficient systems. You can dismiss the perplexing problems that are all about you with shrugs of indifference. You can lull yourself into a comfortable state of complacency by accepting the status quo. The degree that you are about to receive is no guarantee to the contrary. Scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer recently observed that one thing that is new is the prevalence of newness, the changing scale and scope of change itself so that the world alters as we walk in it, so that the years of a man's life measure not some small growth or rearrangement or modification of what he learned in childhood, but a great upheaval. We can underline the validity of this statement by noting that we now speak of being on the move and go, go, go. It is my sincere conviction that we have provided you with the techniques for growth. It is my earnest hope that you recognize that your education is not over, but rather just beginning, and that you appreciate the magnificent opportunities for decision-making that are yours as a result of the options being presented to you by these changing times. Rather than being judged as the 1966 version of the Model T, may you be recognized as fitting elements of our expanding universe, even as the stars. Will the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy degree please rise? <coughs> Mr. President. These candidates, having completed all the requirements for the Doctor of Philosophy degree, the highest degree in course, are recommended to you by the faculty of the Graduate College for the conferring of this degree. On recommendation of the faculty of the Graduate College and by authority of the State Board of Regents, I confer upon you the degree Doctor of Philosophy. Will the graduates please be seated. Now the names of the students will be called and each will go to the platform. Gil Daniel Allardyce. Arnie Skit Anderson. Mr. Anderson majored in the field of botany. Bruce Allen Anderson. This Mr. Anderson majored in mathematics, comes from Bismarck, North Dakota. Mary Ruth Van Dyke Anderson. This Miss Anderson is also a Robert major in mathematics. Montgomery Bonson. Mr. Bonson comes from Rock Island and was a major in the field of physics. John Paul Bakke. Mr. Bakke majored in speech and dramatic art and is from Wakan. Gilbert Joseph Banville. Mr. Banville comes from Canada and was a botany major. John Warren Belisle. Mr. Belisle is from Wisconsin and was a student in the field of chemistry. Keith Dale Blaney. Mr. Blaney is from Tipton in Hospital and Health Administration. Robert Carter Borth. Mr. Borth is a pharmacology student. Merton Fred Brown, Jr. Mr. Brown is a botany major. Robert Donald Brown. This Mr. Brown majored in education, comes from St. Joseph, Minnesota. Charles Theodore Clauser. Mr. Clauser majored in the field of music. Gerald Cook. Mr. Cook majored in psychology. Rodney Owen Davis, committee chairman, assistant professor, Malcolm J. Rohrbaugh. Mr. Davis majored in history. Norman Kent Denzen. 
Committee Chairman, Assistant Professor Stephen P. Spitzer. Mr. Denzen was a sociology student. James Raymond Dow. Committee Chairman, Professor Fred L. Failing. Mr. Dow uh, is in the field of Lloyd German. Lloyd Winfield Farley. Committee Chairman, Professor Marvin S. Thostenson. Mr. Farley's field was music. Paul Hans Fromm. Committee Chairman, Professor Donald J. Kiesler. Psychology is his field. Mern Arthur Harris. Committee Chairman, Professor Christopher Losh. Another history student. Robert Renwick Hawthorne. Committee Chairman, Professor L.A. Van Dyke. Mr. Hawthorne majored in education. Jerry Bruce Hook. Committee Chairman, Assistant Professor Harold E. Williamson. A pharmacology student. Mont Rawlings Juchow. Committee Chairman, Professor James R. Fouts, Department of Pharmacology. Also a pharmacology student, of course. Joseph Anthony Coos. Committee Chairman, Professor Dean E. Williams, Department of Speech Pathology and Audiology. Melvin Leroy Kramer. Committee Chairman, Professor William J. Masson, Department of Office Management and Business Education. Mr. Kramer comes from Waverly. Robert Edward Lee. Committee Chairman, Associate Professor Edwin Gordon, Department of Music Education, and Mr. Professor Leonard S. Felt, College of Education. Mr. Lee also comes from Waverly. Kenneth Edward Lindner. Committee Chairman, Professor T.R. Porter, Department of Science Education. Mr. Lindner's from La Crosse, Ronald Wisconsin. Lee Litherland. Committee Chairman, Professor Kenneth B. Hoyt, College of Education. An Iowa City student. John Merton Love. Committee Chairman, Professor Charles C. Spiker, Department of Child Behavior and Development. From Davis, California. Mary Elizabeth Lyon. Committee Chairman, Professor M. Gladys Scott, Department of Physical Education for Women. This student from Sioux City. Michael Dominic Mancusi. Committee Chairman, Associate Professor Edwin Norbeck, Department of Physics and Astronomy. From Plainview, New York. Ferdinand John Mathis. Committee Chairman, Professor Walter Krauss, Department of Economics. From Iowa City. James <coughs> Russell McIntosh. Committee Chairman, Professor Carl Kamemeyer, Department of Chemical Engineering. Student is from Kisaka. James Richard McNally. Committee Chairman, Donald C. Bryant, Department of Speech. The Maurice student from Iowa Eugene City. Eugene Monhart. Committee Chairman, Professor Richard Hervick, Department of Music. Mr. Moonhart is from Decorah. Franklin David Moore. Committee Chairman, Professor Lawrence A. Ware, Department of Electrical Engineering. Mr. Moore is from Iowa City. Richard Allen Morgan. Committee Chairman, Professor John K. Stilley, Department of Chemistry. His home is Macomb, Lodlin Illinois. Corley Munson. Committee Chairman, Professor Margaret G. Fox, Department of Physical Education for Women. A student from Eugene, John Oregon. Charles Nichols. Committee Chairman, Professor Harry T. Muley, Department of Mathematics. Student from Barrington, Holland Illinois. Ober. Committee Chairman, Professor William M. Furnish, Department of Geology. St. Paul, Minnesota. Denishaw Berger Patel. Committee Chairman, Assistant Professor Donald T. Widiak, College of Pharmacy. Foreign student from India. Nicolasa Pella Pemp Benito. Committee Chairman, Professor James O. Osborne, Department of Chemical Engineering. Another foreign student, the Philippines. William Irvin Wright. Committee Chairman, Professor Henry H. Albers, Department of Business Administration. From Kelowna, Iowa. James Collier Searles. Committee Chairman, Professor C. Roland Leeson, Department of Anatomy. 
Bliss, Iowa City. Richard Byron Stewart, Committee Chairman, Associate Professor William J. Harrick, Mechanical Engineering. From Boulder, Colorado. John Richard Swanson, Committee Chairman, Professor Clyde M. Berry, Department of Preventive Medicine and Environmental Health. Another Iowa City student. Milad Abdel Malak Tawadros, Committee Chairman, Professor William A. Maurer, Department of Economics. A foreign student from Egypt. William Allen Watts, Committee Chairman, Professor William J. Masson, Department of Office Management and Business Education. This student from Macomb, Illinois. This was the last of the PhD candidates to receive degrees. Uh, 68 students in this group, although only 48 of them, I think it was, were actually present. The others are receiving their degrees in absentia. President Vaughn is remaining Will standing. Will the candidates for the various master's degrees please rise? Mr. President, these candidates, having completed all of their requirements for the degrees as listed in the commencement program, are recommended to you by the faculty of the Graduate College for the conferring of these degrees. On recommendation of the faculty of the Graduate College and by authority vested in me by the State Board of Regents, I confer on each of you the degree Master of Arts or Master of Science or Master of Fine Arts, or Master of Business Administration, or Specialist in Education, or Masters of Arts in Teaching, or Master of Arts in Social Work. Will the graduates please be seated? This is a very large group, 377 students altogether. These graduate students were presented by the Dean of the Graduate College, the Dean D.C. Priesters Bach, now Dean Dewey B. Stewart of the College of Liberal Arts. Candidates for the degrees in the College of Liberal Arts. In behalf of the faculty of the college, I extend congratulations and best wishes to you on the successful completion of your respective courses of study. I should like on this occasion to recognize particularly those who are graduating with honors and those graduating with distinction. You who are graduating with honors in your particular fields have completed special courses of study which have enriched your educational experiences on the campus and which should provide an especially good foundation for continued study in graduate and professional schools. I congratulate you for putting forth this extra effort to earn your bachelor's degrees with honors. May I say that there are 25 students in our class of 791 who are receiving this honor. Those of you who are graduating with distinction, high distinction, and highest distinction deserve recognition for the continued high quality of your work in college. Grades are not perfect measures of educational achievement, but in general, they do reflect superior performance. Congratulations to you on your good work. Finally, I should like to commend all of you who have exerted special efforts or who have overcome obstacles to obtain your college education. I commend you whether you be in the top 10 percent of the grade distribution, the bottom 10 percent, or the great middle range. Many of the prizes in life are won not necessarily because of superior ability, but because of perseverance, hard work, and of dedication to the task at hand. I trust that the lessons which you have learned on this campus and the success which you have achieved will stand you in good stead in the years before you. Now may I ask the candidates for the degrees Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Fine Arts, Bachelor of Music and Bachelor of Science in the College of Liberal Arts to please rise. <laughs> Mr. President, 
these candidates have completed all of the requirements for the degrees as they are listed in the commencement program and are recommended to you by the faculty of the College of Liberal Arts for the conferring of these degrees. On recommendation of the faculty of the College of Liberal Arts and by authority of the State Board of Regents, I confer upon each of you the degree Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Fine Arts, Bachelor of Science, or Bachelor of Music. Will the graduates please be seated. This is the largest group to receive degrees this morning, a total of 791. Now Dean Mason, lad of the College of Law. My remarks are directed primarily to the candidates for the degrees in law. I congratulate you upon the successful completion of your studies in the College of Law. The work has been demanding and difficult. It has required your best and very prolonged efforts. You have received a fine legal education. Your College of Law at Iowa is outstanding, and you may take pride in the fact that you have had your legal education in one of the foremost law schools in America. Much is expected of you in the work of your profession and in the performance of your public duties in your communities, in the state, and in the nation. We regard you as prepared to enter into the profession and to fulfill the large and diversified demands of a complex and highly organized society. Our objective has been to discipline your minds, to enlarge your vision, and to develop qualities of character, all of which will enable you to chart the course of the law in a new and a changing world. But remember always that it takes broad vision and great hearts as well as great minds to fulfill the demands and to attain the ideals of the law in the making of a great America and of a society which will endure. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel very close uh, to this year's graduating class. It is an exceptional group of men and women. We've had many fine classes in the College of Law. This is one of our very best. In a sense, we are graduating together. We are both finishing our work at the university, and we're both facing great tasks ahead. Will the candidates for the degrees of Juris Doctor and Bachelor of Laws please rise? <laughs> Mr. President, these candidates have completed all of the requirements for the degrees of Bachelor of Laws and Juris Doctor, respectively, and are recommended to you by the faculty of the College of Law for the conferring of these degrees. On recommendation of the faculty of the College of Law and by authority of the State Board of Regents, I confer upon you the degree Bachelor of Laws or Juris Doctor. You may be seated. There are 75 students in this group. Next, Dean Robert C. Harden of the College of Medicine. Members of the graduating class of the College of Medicine, I bring to you the congratulations of your teachers and their wishes for your continued success. You were hand-picked to study medicine and we know that there have been times when you have 
felt hand to pluck. <laughs> Your course is a rigorous one, and any congratulation that comes to you today is well earned. Last night, in a separate convocation, you pledged to follow a code of conduct embodied in the ancient oath of Hippocrates. This governs your relationships with your professional colleagues, the sick who seek your help, and their families. However, as physicians, you will have broader responsibilities. You have heard a good deal about this this morning. Your special knowledge is as important to the community in which you will live as it will be to the individuals who make up that community. You should become an active working citizen of your town, your county, your state, and your nation. The principles embodied in the oath of Hippocrates will serve as well to govern your relationships with society as to direct the practice of your art. I would hope that you would guard against the seeking of special consideration which may be offered to you because of the unique position you will hold in your community. This is a quick road to disillusion. You will find greater happiness and greater satisfaction in service to society and the people in it. Your goal should be not special privilege, but special responsibility. Will the candidates for the degree Doctor of Medicine please rise? Mr. President. These candidates, having completed all of the requirements for the degree Doctor of Medicine, are recommended to you by the faculty of the College of Medicine for the conferring of this degree. On recommendation of the faculty of the College of Medicine and by authority of the State Board of Regents, I confer upon each of you the degree Doctor of Medicine. Physicians, please be seated. There are 111 students in this graduating class. Next, Dean George S. Easton of the College of Dentistry. To the members of the graduating class in dentistry, last night at our convocation ceremonies, I spoke to you at some length about uh, responsibilities. I'm sure that at the same time, I extended to you the congratulations of the faculty for having achieved this uh, promotion, which has now come to you, or is about to come to you. There's no need to further, or in any sense, belabor what has already been said about your responsibilities. But I do want to make one additional statement. You have it within your power to add or detract from the reputation of your profession. It is my belief, and it's a very firm belief, that the image of dentistry will appear increasingly brighter as a result of your membership in the professional group. The other thing I ask is that don't let me down. I wish for you a happy, a healthful, and a successful career. Will the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Dental Surgery please rise? <laughs> Mr. President, these candidates have completed all of the requirements for the degree Doctor of Dental Surgery and are therefore recommended to you by the faculty, by the College of, of the College of Dentistry for the conferring of this degree. On recommendation of the faculty of the College of Dentistry and by authority of the State Board of Regents, I confer upon each of you the degree Doctor of Dental Surgery. 
Will the doctors of dental surgery please be seated? Fifty-four students from the College of Dentistry have just received their degrees. Next, Dean Lewis sees off of the College of Pharmacy. I address my remarks to the candidates for the degree in pharmacy. I extend the congratulations of the faculty of the College of Pharmacy to each of you. The university will today certify you as to your eligibility for a degree in pharmacy. You're academically qualified to discharge the responsibilities of a pharmacist as prescribed by the laws of the various states. Your knowledge must now be implemented by professional judgment and mature decisions to meet the problems which you will meet in your pharmaceutical practice. Your professional judgment will be as valuable as your knowledge is current. This is another way of my reminding you of the fact that you must continue your education because pharmaceuticals move rapidly and it is essential that the pharmacist be fully informed and must precede his knowledge of the pharmaceuticals prior to their professional and general usage. Continuing education, as has been mentioned several times this morning, is therefore very important to you. You must maintain a continuous adjustment of your intellectual storehouse. The impact and the demands of legislation, current legislation, will be an additional burden upon you as young pharmacists. You will, I am certain, discharge your professional responsibilities in an ethical manner. <coughs> we invite you to return to the College of Pharmacy frequently. Mr. President, will the candidates for the degree Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy please rise? These candidates have completed all of the requirements for the degree Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy and are recommended to you by the faculty of the College of Pharmacy for the conferring of this degree. On recommendation of the faculty of the College of Pharmacy and by authority of the State Board of Regents, I confer upon each of you the degree Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy. Will the pharmacists please be seated? There are 28 graduates this June from the College of Pharmacy. Now, Dean Hunter Rouse of the College of Engineering. To you engineering students who are graduating today, let me express the appreciation of all of us that you chose this profession rather than one of the so-called glamour fields about which we hear so much. The engineer is needed now as never before because he can do something essential that even a scientist cannot. Let me quote from an old friend, the late Theodore von Karman, an engineer who understood science so well that he was granted the first National Science Medal. He said, a scientist explores what is. An engineer creates what has not been. Engineers must never forget this, their special role in life. For the physical progress of civilization depends upon it. Will engineering candidates please rise? <laughs> Mr. President, these candidates, having completed all the requirements for the degrees as listed in the commencement program, are recommended to you by the faculty of the Engineering College for the conferring of these degrees. 
On recommendation of the faculty of the College of Engineering and by authority of the State Board of Regents, I confer upon each of you the degree Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering or Civil Engineering or Electrical Engineering or Industrial Engineering or Mechanical Engineering. The engineers will please be seated. 66 new engineers from the University of Iowa. Next, Dean B.L. Barnes of the College of Business <coughs> Administration. The faculty of the College of Business Administration joins me in extending congratulations and best wishes to this class of candidates for degrees earned in the various programs of the college. Through a balanced curriculum of instruction in business, the arts, and the social and physical sciences, every effort has been made to prepare you to attain a high level of professional competence and a satisfying philosophy of life. The diploma you will receive today marks but an interval in your professional development. As you pursue your individual careers, you also must assume a great deal of responsibility for the development and the clarification of broad national business and economic policy. Among the multiplicity of challenges facing future business leaders, the basic economic challenge is whether the U.S. economy, relying primarily upon individual initiative and free markets, can perform more efficiently than a tightly controlled and an excessively planned economy. It will be your responsibility to play an active part in achieving and maintaining high employment of our resources and a high rate of growth in our gross national product. And to accomplish this, without sacrificing the economic and political freedoms of the individual. It also will be your responsibility to obtain rising living standards for all people, and greater equality of social and economic opportunity, and at the same time to preserve the dignity of the individual. I urge you to continue to seek knowledge in order that you maximize your professional career. But even more important, so that you might live up to this responsibility to play a vital role in a dynamic society. Will the candidates for the BBA degree please rise? <clears throat> Mr. President, <clears throat> these candidates, having completed all requirements for the degree Bachelor of Business Administration, are recommended to you by the faculty of the College of Business Administration for the conferring of this degree. On recommendation of the faculty of the College of Business Administration and by authority of the State Board of Regents, I confer upon each of you the degree Bachelor of Business Administration. Will the graduates be seated, please? This also is a fairly large group, 166. Now, Dean Laura C. Dustin of the College of Nursing. Graduates of the College of Nursing, speakers who address graduating seniors traditionally do two things. First, they praise you for completing a course of study, and secondly, they exhort you to go forth from the hallowed halls to do good, to be good, to use your goodly heritage for personal and public advancement, and in a word, to do better with the ingredients of the good life than those of us who have walked this path before. For your sakes and mine, I wish I might follow tradition, because it is a safe, easy path which requires no thought, no uncomfortable soul-searching, and no questioning of the motives and mores of our society. In fact, the hallmark of our modern culture appears to be a preoccupation with safety and self-protection, which is characterized by the oft-repeated remark, don't ask me to help, I don't want to get involved. But I submit to you that when at the tender age of 14 or 15, you chose for yourselves a career in nursing, you gave up the chance to turn yourselves away from your fellow human beings. You selected for yourselves a life of caring for and caring about others. You made your career choice 
not on rational, reasoned thought, but because you have within you that rather rare ingredient of humane concern. And willy-nilly, you made a career commitment which your faculty has supported and fostered during your college years. Yet, because you are women, and because of your career commitment, our society now faces you with one of the most puzzling dilemmas of our time. On the one hand, our social customs and cultural mores still say that the woman's place is in the home, where she is the support and comfort of her husband and the bearer of his children, the meal getter, the family taxi driver, the lawn mower and garden tender, the club woman, the morning coffee drinker, the afternoon bridge player, and so on ad infinitum. As a wife and mother, the better you perform these functions, the more prestige accrues to your family's social position and stature in the community. On the other hand, our legislators, who are hotly in pursuit of the good life for all, and a few votes on the side, I presume, have recently passed and funded piece after piece of legislation which provide the means for much needed and improved health services for large segments of our population. If these expanded services are to become operational, ever-increasing numbers of nurses must be recruited to fill the many challenging and demanding positions created by the new programs and projects. In particular, nurses with college preparation are desperately needed to give guidance, direction, and vision so that the cold language of legislation is translated into meaningful, practical, and sensible action programs. Without nurses, many of these programs will fail. And yet, most nurses are women, who in large measure are governed by the wishes and needs of husbands and families, or in a word, by society's dictates, customs, and mores. So where does this leave you, all 85 of you? You represent the pride and achievement of the faculty of the College of Nursing. You are wanted and desperately needed to transform paper legislation and paper money into tangible, meaningful programs for people who need your hearts, your heads, your comforting hands and voices. On the other hand, you are female. You are already married or soon will be. Some of you already have children and others will have. Your children need you. Your husband's careers are always considered of more importance than yours, even though you have the potential of contributing a comparable amount to the financial support of the family. Your dilemma is real and deeply rooted in our society's conflicting philosophies concerning the role of women. If I could follow graduation tradition, I would simply ask that you do good. But because I am a proud professional, I ask you to make workable the concept of marriage and a career. Your generation must solve this problem. If nursing, still considered a woman's occupation, is to do its share of converting the legislator's dream into better health services for all. As your dean, I ask only that you too accept the responsibilities inherent in professionalism. Will the graduates of the College of Nursing please rise? Mr. President, these candidates, having completed all the requirements for the degree Bachelor of Science in Nursing, 
are recommended to you by the faculty of the College of Nursing for the conferring of this degree. On recommendation of the faculty of the College of Nursing and by authority of the State Board of Regents, I confer upon each of you the degree Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Will the candidates please be seated? As Dean Dustin has said, a total of 85 graduates this morning in the field of nursing. The next speaker, I think, will be Dean Howard Jones of the College of Education. The College of Education, jointly with other colleges in the university, prepares teachers. At this commencement, besides conferring degrees, the university recognizes those who have successfully completed teacher education programs. To those qualifying for teacher certificates, we honor you for your scholarship, your ability to infuse others with the desire for inquiry, your commitment to the profession of teaching. We enjoin you to remember that in the future, you will be judged not so much by what you know as by what you are curious about. We urge you to be ever mindful that the task of education is both to release the creative energies of individuals and to improve the quality of living in a community. Will the graduates from the various university colleges who are qualifying for teaching certificates please rise. This is a very large number of students. They are standing up in various parts of the auditorium. These graduates, as an integral part of their college course, have completed professional studies in education. The State Board of Public Instruction recognizes the achievement of these men and women and has empowered the university to present to those who will teach in Iowa the appropriate teaching certificate. The University of Iowa cooperates with the State Board of Public Instruction in the preparation of men and women who will teach in the elementary and secondary schools. The university is glad to share the responsibility for educating good teachers. To you who have chosen to enter the honored profession of teaching, we extend hearty congratulations. Please be seated. Most of the students who stood were in the College of Liberal Arts or the College of Education, but a few stood who come from other colleges the in the university. The academic and faculty representatives please go to their respective graduates and present diplomas. We now come to the part of the program which is designated the presentation of diplomas. Uh, this is where the uh, tables that I mentioned earlier come into use on the south side of the field house, beside the area in which the uh, graduates, the new graduates are sitting, are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven card tables. And on these card tables, which are tastefully decorated with a black cloth, uh, are stacks of diplomas. There are two kinds of diplomas, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And then there are similar card tables on the north side, uh, just uh, below us. I can't see enough of the area to be sure how many tables there are. I can see four, and there may uh, very well be more. Now the students have started to come forward to receive their diplomas. Uh, these tables are strategically placed at the head of each uh, uh, seating area uh, for uh, the various colleges and the students come and get their diplomas and then walk around and back to their seats. So in effect, we have a, a, a whole series of, of circles uh, beginning to form, moving circles. And as I've said on other occasions, it gets a little confusing of the person who wears the kind of, uh, kind of glasses that, uh, that I wear. Circles of students all over the uh, field house floor, coming up to the tables, getting their diploma, shaking hands with the person uh, who hands them uh, the diploma, and then uh, returning uh, to their seats. The deans of the larger uh, colleges, that is the colleges with the larger numbers of students, 
uh, have assistance so that there are several tables operating for the College of Liberal Arts. I see uh, Dean Stewart down here and I see uh, Dean Howard Jones uh, handing out diplomas to students who uh, are receiving degrees in education. I see Dean uh, Spreestersbach on uh, the other side of the field house on the south side. I can't quite make out from this distance uh, all of the people who are officiating. I do see Dean Hunter Rouse. I uh, recognize the, uh, the hood as designating the engineers. Uh, but uh, students all over the place now are moving around to get their diplomas and to return to their seats. All of the students, except those in the professional colleges, are receiving folders, actually, uh, little folders, uh, the regular diploma folder, for those of you who have seen diplomas in recent years. But this folder contains not the diploma itself, but a message from the president of the university to, to the student. The reason for this is that the diploma itself has the student's name on it, and with 1,840 graduates and some last minute additions and deletions and absences, it's hard to match the names of the students, uh, the, the diplomas with the names on them, with the actual people here in the field house. It would be very difficult, and if you happen to get off, then everyone would receive, you see, the wrong diploma. So the students don't actually get their diplomas now. This is a a sort of symbolic presentation. Uh, they pick up their real diplomas, however, before they leave the field house, right after the exercises in the west end of the field house. The diplomas are neatly arranged by colleges and alphabetically. And when the students turn in their caps and gowns as they march out at the completion of the recessional, uh, they will uh, get their actual diplomas. The professional students, that is those in engineering and pharmacy and dentistry and medicine and law, I think, receive larger diplomas, diplomas that are closer the size of the old-fashioned diploma that you and I remember. Uh, these diplomas are suitable for framing, and I'm sure, I'm sure that you've seen them on the walls of your doctor's office or your dentist's office or your, your uh, lawyer's office. What they are receiving now is a scroll this same size, uh, looking like a diploma ought to look, that is, uh, rolled up and tied with a ribbon, and containing this same message from the president that I mentioned earlier. I thought you might be interested in hearing the president's message to the graduates. I have a copy in front of me. He says, Dear graduate, congratulations on your educational attainment as recognized at this commencement. I extend to you my best wishes for personal satisfaction and success in whatever you undertake in the weeks and years ahead. Whether you have already selected your vocation or whether it will evolve from your early post-university experiences, you may find some difficult and unexpected decisions ahead. A truly satisfying vocation demands of the individual that he find his calling not only in his work, but also in his role as a citizen and member of the community. Today, more than ever before, I believe a good vocation requires the individual to balance the more tangible goals of financial reward, leisure, and security against the more compelling but elusive goals of human dignity and freedom, a just social structure, and humane culture. It is my fondest hope that your experiences at the University of Iowa the friendships and associations you have formed, the ideas and values you have shared will in some measure help you to achieve this balance. If they do, I believe you will then recall this day with a special sense of personal satisfaction and pride. And this uh, printed letter is signed by President Howard R. Bowen, president of the University of Iowa. This is what the student receives when he picks up his diploma folder or diploma scroll, and uh, then he turns it in. No, I guess he doesn't actually turn it in. I think, uh, uh, I think he uh, keeps this and receives also his actual diploma uh, when he turns in his cap and gown at the conclusion of the exercises. 
While I've been talking, the students have been circling in this countless number of circles down on the main floor area. Have been receiving, uh, the students have been uh, receiving these um, diplomas or letters from the president and have been returning to their seats. In the meantime, the uh, audience is watching with interest. Uh, the members of the audience, of course, try to find the particular graduate or graduates in whom they are interested. As I've said before, it's not easy to uh, pick out that person because uh, all of the students tend to look alike in their black caps and gowns and it's very difficult to distinguish them. The audience is a bright and colorful one today. Uh, summer clothes, spring clothes. I guess I should give my uh, annual fashion uh, announcement. I notice uh, a good bit of green and yellow, light greens and yellows in the audience today, and, and a sprinkling of, uh, of reds. But the predominant color, for some reason, seems to be yellow and green, and combinations of yellow and, uh, and green. Practically all of the students now have gotten their diplomas. The last official to finish his chore appears to be Dean, uh, Dean Jones. Uh, he has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight students still to congratulate. I see he has plenty of diploma folders. I think uh, Dean Rhodes uh, puts more folders on the tables than he knows he will need so that he's sure he doesn't uh, run out. It would be a terrible thing, of course, if you ran out of diplomas and if the last few people didn't get any. Oh, I see there are still a few in another column. I can't... Uh, uh, see who it is who is handing out those diplomas, but there are still a few people there. Dean uh, Jones has finished and is starting his uh, walk to the platform. When the band started to play louder or faster there, I thought he should quicken his pace and run to the uh, uh, stage, but he ignored it and went along in the usual uh, academic pace for commencements. There are still um, a few people uh, taking their seats in the back of the field house but um, I think they all now have their diplomas. I see Dean Rhodes returning to his uh, chair up front. I can't quite see who is with him. And I think this means that uh, all of the uh, diplomas have been handed out. The next item on the program will be the charge to the graduates by President Howard R. Bowen, president of the university. President Bowen is seated on the platform, of course, in a chair that is different from the other chairs. It's a high-backed chair, a cathedral-type chair. Uh, he has a microphone in front of the chair uh, at standing height so that when he uh, uh, presents uh, the degrees, confers the degrees, he can do that from his chair. His other statements to the graduates and to the audience uh, have been from the lectern in the center of, of the stage, and he now has gotten up from his chair and is approaching the lectern and will deliver his charge to the graduates. At this time, for the entire university community, I should like to pay a tribute and express our thanks to the two retiring deans, Dean George S. Easton of the College of Dentistry and Dean Mason Ladd of the College of Law. Between them, these two gentlemen have given nearly 80 years of devoted service to the University of Iowa. Their contributions have been beyond measure. We are deeply indebted to them. Will you stand, Dean Easton? The applause is for Dean George Easton, who is retiring this July 1st as Dean of the College of Dentistry. Dean Ladd, will you please stand? And this applause, of course, is for Dean Ladd, who also is retiring on July 1st. Now we are gathered to honor students who have distinguished themselves in learning, which is the central business of the university. I speak for the entire faculty in expressing to you, the learners, our appreciation of your accomplishments and our congratulations. 
I should like also to greet each of the parents, wives, husbands, and children of the graduates. I am mindful of the sacrifices that lie behind the triumph of this day, but I am also aware of the rich satisfaction you have received as you have watched your member of the graduating class progress toward graduation. The University of Iowa is many things. It is a set of distinctive buildings located on the banks of a peaceful river. It is a community of more than 17,000 hardworking students and faculty members, each of whom can carry on a unique program of studies and activities according to his own personal interests and goals. Through research and scholarship, the university is a carrier of our culture and a creative source of new ideas. Through professional activities of its faculty, the university is a center of influence on the economic and social development of our state and nation. It is a place that is open to ideas, new and old, a place where ideas are considered on their merits. It is also a place of fateful decision where young men and women are testing their values, establishing their personal styles, choosing careers, and even selecting wives and husbands. It is a cultural, intellectual, and artistic center with a rich fair of lectures, conferences, discussions, debates, music, art, theater, available both to students and to the citizens of the state. And it is a social center where there is an abundance of friendships, sports, and good times. But for the benefits, uh, benefit of parents and alumni, however, I should add that it is a much more serious and less flamboyant social center than it was when we were young. We have realized, as never before in our country, the enormous power of learning when applied to the conduct of human affairs. And the primary source of this learning, we have come to realize, is the university. Members of the graduating class, you have been privileged to share in a rich cultural heritage that has been handed down to you by generations of scholars, scientists, artists, and teachers who have sought steadfastly for the truth, often at great personal sacrifice. You are to be heartily commended for rising to your opportunities. But by accepting the heritage of former generations, you have incurred great responsibilities. Accordingly, I ask each of you to carry on your education so long as you live and to use that education in the service of your fellow men, to do your part according to your talents in advancing our cultural heritage to seek the truth and defend it, even when the truth is inconvenient and unpopular. And finally, to support the cause of education so that future generations may receive the same benefits you have enjoyed. And now I should like to express my personal congratulations to each of you and to wish you well in all your future endeavors. Thank you. You have been listening to the charge to the graduates by the president of the university, Dr. Howard R. Bowen. Now the university hymn, Old Gold. We shall close our exercises by singing our university hymn. You will find the words on page one. I now invite you to rise and join with us.
receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. The singing of the university hymn, Old Gold, and the pronouncing of the benediction bring to a close the June 1966 commencement exercises at the University of Iowa. The university now has 1,840 proud new alumni who are just starting to march out of the field house, at least to the other end of the field house, in the traditional recession. There they will deposit their caps and gowns and pick up their real diplomas and then hurry around through this immense crowd to find their friends and relatives and receive well-merited congratulations. I have witnessed more commencement exercises than I care to remember, but I always find them moving, stimulating, and impressive. What makes them so, of course, is the fact that they mark significant educational progress in the careers of young people who will be the leaders of tomorrow. And tomorrow is just around the corner. Walking from this room at this moment are the doctors, nurses, dentists, lawyers, teachers, business leaders, engineers, pharmacists, and in general, the educated citizens on whom our state and nation will soon depend. This makes it, as I am sure you will agree, a most important moment. And I know you will want to join with me in extending to these new graduates congratulations and best wishes for success and happiness. John Sandro, the WSUI engineer who has been with me in the announcer's booth, and I want to thank you for tuning in and we return you now to the main studios. These are the broadcasting facilities of the University of Iowa. You've been listening to the 1966 Spring Commencement Exercises at the University of Iowa. Your commentator was Dr. Orville A. Hitchcock, Professor of Speech at the University. You're in tune with University Radio, WSUI, in Iowa City, 28 minutes past 11 o'clock, Central Daylight Time. We invite you to join us now for our great recordings of the past. As announced in our music guide, this morning's program will be devoted to music sung by Florence Foster Jenkins, a recording of her Carnegie Hall concert of October 25th, 1944. These notes preceding our listening to this unique songstress, few artists ever gave such unalloyed pleasure as Florence Foster Jenkins, yet this extraordinary soprano had the wisdom not